Hello, friends, and welcome to Conversations. Today, we have Mandy. Welcome, Mandy, to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, this is great. Okay, so one of my favorite topics is talking to authors about writing a book. So we are going to talk about that for sure. But before that, I want to know what is your background and then what are you currently doing for your job right now? Yeah, absolutely. So my background is uh, kind of interesting. Um, I, my career, I, I was just talking to someone the other day saying I, my career was just pulling me along. Like I just kind of, it took me places. I, really didn't have a plan. Um, I wound up in the recruitment technology industry. Um, My first job in the space was for a a job board, a small job board owner, ran it, had an accountant. I came in as an admin assistant in in college, Um, wound up wearing several different hats um, and just was absolutely blessed to have an amazing mentor who saw my thirst to understand and really get to know the space and what we were doing and how I could help. Um, so I started, started there as an admin assistant, um, wound up moving around into a sales capacity, which I never thought I would do. Um, but I happened to be quite good at probably because I don't like sales. And so I did things differently more as a consultant, um, and then eventually was recruited uh, into ZipRecruiter uh, with my first executive title. Um, I was there for four and a half years. Zip was the most amazing ride, such a fun time. Uh, it was a rocket ship. Uh, it taught me a lot about leadership. Um, in the beginning stages, I didn't realize I was dealing with imposter syndrome because we had this oh. team of like incredible minds. Like I used to say, I worked from home for the first year. I used to say you walk into the office and you gain IQ points just by being around all of these people. And it was amazing. And so I always kind of internally felt like I didn't fit in, um, but they always made me feel like I fit in and they listened to me and they were like, wow, you really know this. And I'm like, oh, like I do. Yes. Um, and it took finally having a boss who loves books as much as you and I, Um, gifting his whole executive team with books over the holidays. And one of the books he was adamant that we needed to read was Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. Um, Oh, I'm writing that down. Yes. Yeah. Oh, if you haven't read it yet. I haven't. You have a, it's not just me moment. Um, I guarantee you every single woman in the workforce that I've ever handed the book to, to, to read it or recommended it to, has come back and had the same moment I did. When I finally got around to reading it, I got to work and I stormed into his office, which is not something I would normally do. (laughs) And I slammed my (laughs) hand down on his desk and I was like, oh my God, it's not just me. And he was like, oh, you finally read it. And I was like, yes, holy cow. I didn't realize I had imposter syndrome. I didn't like all the second guessing and the doubting and the frustrations that I had. I didn't realize that's what this was. And it took me on a, on a journey because I realized it's not just women that face imposter syndrome. It's really anybody who is in a group that's less represented in what they're doing, right? Because you don't see yourself sitting across the table or cubicle or wherever you are. Mm -hmm. Um, So you feel kind of like the odd, odd man out, right? Yeah. Um, You question yourself. And it does happen, especially for women. There's tons of studies in Lean In uh, that talk about how as girls in school and women in the workforce, we tend to not raise our hands as much. Uh, We tend to think we need to have everything down from A to Z to be able to take the next step. And that's not how boys and men typically behave. Um, And so there's a challenge there. So I, from there, I, I built out a, kind of some diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, I had a lean in group called women in TA tech, um, for our industry, um, which was amazing. And we did some kind of ladies nights things at, at zip because there was a lot of new to the workforce women in, in the company. Um, and I wanted to make sure they had access to as many of, you know, female executives and managers And anyone else, frankly, that was willing to be a mentor and to kind of 
and, you know, cut, cut imposter syndrome off at the knees and make sure they had access to the information they needed to know and just be a mentor, be an ear for them. So that was amazing. Wow. Uh, All of that experience kind of led me back to a dream I had that sat on the shelf. I, from, from zip, I went on, I had a few other um, executive roles where I kind of moved up and proved to myself, I can do it somewhere else. Cause I, you know, just when you handle imposter syndrome and recognize it doesn't mean it goes away. It can come back. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's kind back. of a way to keep you humble maybe, but at the same time, it's like, you should give yourself kudos because you don't always get it from a boss or, you know, a mentor. You oh, should absolutely. be able to be like, okay, I did that. You know, that was yes. a really good job. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's important too. A lot of women, we don't take the time to shine the light on ourselves and appreciate and have gratitude for the work that we've done. Um, and you know, in the world I come from very male dominated and I've been so incredibly blessed to have amazing male mentors in, in bosses and colleagues and friends. Um, a lot of times they say it's chest pounding. Um, and I once had someone tell, tell me you're not very good at chest pounding. I'm like, well, I don't like to do that. Like I'd rather, just share the data and you can recognize it for what it is, or I'd rather, you know, do the chest pounding, but for my teams. Um, but it was a good lesson. There's a different way that women feel comfortable with it or just people in general of how to acknowledge the wins, but it is important that we do that. Yeah, Um, for sure. So that that's part of what led me down the path of remembering that dream I put on a shelf when I was 17 of wanting to write a book and wanting to motivate people through a book, through speaking, through anything I could. But I realized when I was 17, I'm 17, I'm going to need to have a little more life experience before anyone's going to listen to me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And that's funny too, because at 17, you think you're smarter than everybody anyway. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I can tell, I can teach these people something. So what do you think sets your, your book apart? Like, what was it that you were wanting to get across that you hadn't gotten from other books or other people advice and stuff? Um, that's a great question. I think the the key is melding concepts of leadership. And I am a very harsh judge of what it means to be a good leader. Um, I've seen a lot of different leadership styles and a lot that is lacking in a lot of existing leadership functions. Um, and for women, for people of color, for people, again, in any group that is less represented in what they're doing, Mm -hmm. need a different style of leadership. And I think quite honestly, the pandemic has really shown us how much the game has changed and what people demand from their leaders and from their companies when it comes to leadership and support, belonging, being tied in with the vision of the company. Um, So I really wanted to get that message across, but at the same time, empower people who may not have a quote unquote title um, of leadership, empower them to lead themselves and recognize that we all have opportunities to be a leader and it starts with you. What are your goals? What are your ambitions? How are you going after that? How are you leading yourself? And how can you deal with the leaders that are, around you in your life, in the workplace, what have you to get the best outcome possible. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, it does. And I think it's because there's so many people that are in management positions that don't know how to manage, you know, they have the title, but they don't know how the people skills or something. And it's like, you can't be a bully. You can't badger people into doing things to become better. Like you have to build them up. You're really good at this. If they know that, then they're going to try harder for themselves, which in turn helps the company or the department or whatever. 100%. Emotional intelligence is a huge piece of it. Um, And that's, it's interesting because there's a lot of, you know, I'm generalizing and I try not to do that as much as possible, but there, there are a lot of male leaders out there who come from this kind of old school, I I call old school vision of leadership. And it's generally missing that 
emotional intelligence aspect. And a lot of people look at it as, oh, it's just a soft skill. I'll, I'll focus on that later. They put it on the back burner. When at the end of the day, the message I try to get across in, in the book, there's a couple chapters on leadership and some mm -hmm. pros and cons and tips and how to improve it and find your style. Right. Um, but the biggest thing is you have no idea how applying those soft skills, how massively it can, it can change someone's life quite literally. It can be the difference. And, and I've, I've had this happen. I don't talk about it much, but I was at a company um, that was not a fit for me culturally. Um, I was in an executive position. I knew I was going to be leaving the company, happened to be working late one night. And there was a colleague, or she, uh, this person worked on a team that I didn't manage, but we worked closely together who happened to be there late as well. I knew some things were going on in her personal life and I could see she was very upset and she wanted to leave. And my intuition and my gut said, yeah, no, we're going to have a conversation. Like, let's come here, let's talk. And uh, again, I try, I, I generally don't tell the story because I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but that awareness of what was going on literally saved her life. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, I have a beautiful little angel that she gifted me with afterwards um, that sits out every Christmas. Um, but those things are important. Oh, you 100%. Never, you never know what someone is going through. And if you don't take the time to get to know the people you're working with on a personal level, and you don't take the time to understand what's going on, not just at work, because right. they are a whole person, Right. whatever's going on at home, whatever goals they have, in their personal life, whatever it may be, it may not be connected to work at all, can help you better understand who they are, how they operate, how can you motivate them, and the gratitude that you receive is so far outweighs the effort you put into getting to know them. Right. Um, see it in their performance too. And this is what I tell companies all the time when I consult on you know leadership challenges or getting leaders up to speed. Um, it's like I love the aha moments <laughs> when they're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that understanding their personal goals of fitness and supporting them on that and cheering them on and pointing it out. I had no idea it was going to be connected to see this incredible increase in their performance and their dedication to right. the job. Like, yeah, because people want to know who they're spending all this time with. They want to feel cared about. They want to feel encouraged. It's important. Yeah. <laughs> it correlated, but it is. Right. Yeah. You don't have to be best friends. You don't have to go out and right. have drinks every night after work or talk on the phone, but just right. knowing the person's background, what their goals are in the company, is this just a stepping stone for them? Or would they really like to move up and be in the company? Are they just starting a family and they need that money? You know, there's so many things that you can find out by just talking. Exactly. And, and big life changes change people's goal ambition. Mm -hmm. You can have someone who is like, they just had a big life change. Typically they're going to want something stable, stability, steady state while they figure out what just changed in their life. And then, or, you know, looking forward to a big event, having a baby, a wedding, you know, things like that, their goal ambition is going to increase. Right. And so knowing what's going on is going to help you better serve them. And honestly, I mean, I've had this conversation with employees that I've managed at every company I've been at, um, if this is not your be all end all and what your this is a stepping stone for you, let's find out the skills you need to acquire and let's find a way to do that. I'm going to get more productivity out of you. You're going to be more dedicated because you appreciate that I'm helping you gather these skills. Nine times out of 10, I was able to find another role for people in, in the company but if they left, I've got someone who knows, understands who I am as a leader. I know that I've helped them on their path and that's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Not every 
everybody is meant to stay at the same job in the same company forever. That's just not how it goes anymore. <laughs> right. Right. You know? Yeah. Okay. So I want to pick your brain about this because when I was doing hair, I had all kinds of people from all different kinds of backgrounds sit in my chair. And when we came back from COVID, we were off for two months there was such a mix and it went on for a good year where you'd get the people that are like, I'm doing fine working from home. And they were coming from companies like corporations were sitting in a cubicle, sitting in an office yep. kind of background. And they're like, I don't want to go back. I don't need to go back. I get more work done. I don't have people popping in my office. I don't have the water cooler distracting me. I can get more work done. And then you'd have the bosses who would be like, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know if they're clocking in. I don't know if they're getting all their work done. I don't know if we're, you know, it was such an interesting dynamic that we would never have seen. It was like a science experiment. Yeah. Do you think that it was detrimental for people to not be in the office anymore because they couldn't have that connection, that personal, you know, so it, it's such a, such a great question. Um, and you know, there's a lot to be said about the in-person interactions, but I have worked at companies that were fully remote, hybrid remote, you know, where I was able to see, see people here and there, or we were fully remote. It all comes down to how do you make that connection? You can make, you and I are having a wonderful conversation yeah. with technology, right? right? Um, would it be lovely to sit down in person and have a cup of coffee? Absolutely. But it's the effort that you put into those connections. And when you talk about the, the difference between the employees and the bosses and how they feel about it, to me, that spells, there's, there's a missing component here. There's a lack of trust because there's less control. And sure, there are other things involved with the real estate cost of having your office and nobody in it. Like there's, yeah. you know, very real things and challenges and change is hard for every human being. Just some of us come around to it quicker than others. Yeah. <laughs> for different reasons. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it was such a beautiful thing for people to experience it. Cause I had been working remotely uh, from, from home since I started working from home in 2007, I think five, no, 2005. So, so your like, life didn't change much. So, I mean, and I, and then I've had time where I've worked in the office too and back and forth. Um, so for me, I'm like, I know how great it is. You do get, you are so much more productive from home, um, depending on how you operate. Right. I always, am going to push myself. And in fact, when I first started working from home, my husband was like, okay, can you, put the computer away. You just asked right. me five times while we're sitting on the couch. And I'm like, you're right. I need to put it down. Yeah. Um, doesn't mean I need to work all the time just because it's accessible. It's all right here. Right. Um, but then you have folks who need to be in the office environment to be able to focus on it. So, I mean, it goes both ways, but I think the, the beauty of what happened and so many people experiencing work from home for the first time was a shift in recognizing work-life balance mm -hmm. because a lot of times you just go, go, go. You're, you, you're in your, um, your habits, your daily routines, and you don't really think about it. But when you're suddenly working from home for the first time, all this change is going on. I think it shifted a lot of people's mindsets to realize, you know, these are the things I want from my job. These are the things I want from my company, from my boss. And these are the things I don't want and I'm not going to tolerate. And I think the whole great resignation had a lot to do with people adjusting those, those values and really going, no, nah, no, nope. there, this is, this is the minimum that I need. And if you're not going to provide it, I'm out of here. Um, yeah. which is hard and, and, you know, it's hard for the people on the other end who now have to rehire, but I think it's, it's a rude awakening that needed to happen uh, to make these shifts in, in leadership and how we manage and how we work and recognizing mm -hmm. that we are whole people coming to work. Work is not what we live and breathe and die for. There are other motivations behind it. 
and those matter. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It was, it was such an interesting time and for every kind of business, you know, the restaurant business suffered and, and I was working a long time ago in an office environment and I had to help with the hiring of the people that would clean the buildings and stuff like that. And I thought, what happened to them? Because there were no people going in and out of buildings. I was like, I felt so bad. There were so many jobs that just kind of fizzled away and such an interesting time. But anyway, let's talk more about your book. So faith over fear, um, faith in yourself. Is this religious faith? Faith is my word for 2024. So I just love that that was part of the book name, but so what, who is the faith in? So, um, absolutely by all means, faith in yourself. Um, I do, I am a Christian. Um, and so for me, faith in God I encourage the readers. I'm very, very, very open person when it comes to Mm -hmm. beliefs. Um, I love learning about all different kinds of beliefs and religions. I just think they're beautiful. And I love seeing the connections between all of them. Yeah, me too. Um, So I I try to make it clear in the book, like these, these are my beliefs. I encourage you, the reader to open your mind to finding and fine tuning what your beliefs are, because on the path to fulfillment and purpose and feeling that fulfilling success that you want in your life, it is incredibly helpful to have faith in something bigger than yourself. Um, So at the very least, I I ask them to have faith in yourself and to really hone in on your purpose and the ripple effect that your success can have because that's outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. So it makes it a lot Like, think about it. If you're only thinking about how things are going to affect you when you go after a goal, it's a lot easier to drop it when things get hard because you're the only one affected. Right. At this ripple effect and all these people that it could potentially help in some way, shape or form. It's a lot harder because you feel some sense of accountability. Um, So that's that's where it starts from. It is very open. Do encourage people to open their minds and you know, if they want to say spirit or universe instead Mm -hmm. of God, that is totally up to them. If they believe in something entirely different, totally up to them. Um, I do have Bible verses in, in the book. Um, and I, you know, I try to tell the readers, uh, throughout, like these are sources of comfort and wisdom and knowledge for me. Right. Uh, You don't read the Bible, take it as an amazing quote, right? Uh, it's totally up to you to perceive it how you want. Um, but yes, faith is a huge component. Um, and I've learned that through <laughs> all of my missteps over the years, <laughs> and how to navigate, you know, finding success, but meaningful success. Mm-hmm. I loved how you said earlier from the beginning for you, that where you thought you were going to start off the path took you. That's the way it is. That's life. I mean, for kids that have to figure out what their, um, oh shoot, their college goal, like what are they going to college for? You know, it's like, okay, figure out your major, figure out your major. And they could learn all these skills and then end up being a painter. You know, it's just like, you don't know where you're going to go. It's nice to think that you have a plan. So it's good to have just a core set of values that will help you at your job. But that also, like you said, have a ripple effect and carry over into your life, your families, your relationships, just in general. It's so important. Absolutely. And and it's funny, I used to laugh about um, the fact that I, I graduated with a degree in communications with an emphasis on print journalism. And then my career took off in this direction. I'm, you know, an executive and I'm working with all these people who have business degrees. And I'm like, huh, yep, I have my communications degree. <laughs> Want me to write anything? And, and they always did. Uh, and I was like, oh, I'm not using it. Well, and then, you know, here you turn, are. turn around and here it goes. Right. So you, you do never know. And it's funny you say that I have a high school student um, and we talk about it. I'm like, just try on ideas in your head and see, do you think that would be fulfilling or not? And just start to think about it. You've got some time, but Mm -hmm. crazy out here, how fast some of the kids are making their decisions. I'm like, okay, you're freshman, end of freshman year. Yeah. I just don't want you to stress out (laughs) junior year not having thought about it at all. That's what we're trying to avoid. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. I originally wanted to go to school for journalism. That was my goal. And so I thought, well, if I learn how to do hair, that will be a job that will put me through school, through college. 
well, I wanted to be a reporter and I wanted to talk to different people all the time. So then all of a sudden I'm doing hair and I have somebody different in my chair all the time and I'm getting talked to with them. I thought this is like the same thing. Plus I can be creative. So it, it's just whatever happens, happens. It's meant to be the way and that it goes. Makes you tick. And then here you are with your podcast, right? I know. So that, Who'd have right? thought? <laughs> comes full circle. It finds a way. I feel like I'm cheating. <laughs> you know, it's like all these people that had to go through school for journalism and I'm just like, get a microphone and I can talk to people. Um, what's next for you? Are you going to write another book? Do you think? I, I do think so. I have a ton of ideas swirling. Um, we've, I've talked with my, my kids love that I've written a book. My, my it's middle huge. son. He, he's funny. He always says, you're going to be famous mom because he loves to Google me or like look on YouTube or things. Oh. He's like, mom. And I'm like, we'll see. You know? um, so That's talking, awesome. And there's, there's different age gaps. So right now we have three different schools. So oh elementary, gosh. middle and high school. And so we've talked about the idea of maybe doing a, a book at each grade level and kind of talking to kids about the similar concepts, um, which would be interesting. Um, but I've also had a lot of people who've read the book and said, man, you could turn that into like five more books, just digging deeper on each of the concepts. And I'm like, it's a good idea. Um, so, and wow. Yeah. Be determined, but more than likely I will write another book. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. I, that would be kind of a cool idea is to start at the kids when their brains are still forming and they're trying to understand the dynamics of the work life, the workforce, you know, what their mom and dad do or their grandparents, whoever they're around the most and how to be a success in their own minds and in their job. That would be a really just, interesting. Just learning how to have a success mindset, meaning like you're not just going after goals for the sake of going after goals, because I've done that and it can be addicting, but it's not fulfilling until you take the time to really understand a purpose. Think again, outside of yourself, what's the ripple effect of what I'm trying to do here and learning to embrace failure and mistakes as a growth opportunity. Right. For kids, I've just been astounded by our schools out here who have taught our kids since they were in first, second grade about having a growth mindset, which is that idea of, oh, I, you know, I, I failed at something. Okay, let me see now what I need to learn to do better the next time instead of, oh, I guess I just can't do that. I'm not good at math or, you know, a lot of times how we're kind of pre-wired when, especially in school. Um, and so that's, that's one of the reasons I, I thought about that, because I think if kids can learn, and I tell my kids this all the time, they're like, mom's going to go on another lecture. I'm like, yes, I sure am. Absolutely. Uh, I'm like, that's what can, moms are good at. <laughs> right. I'm like, if you can grasp just even like 10% of these concepts. Now you are far and above what a lot of adults are at, you know, that I've, that I've known and that I'm, I've tried to help and who have that aha moment at 30, 40, 50 years old, you know, you're much younger than that. If you can yeah, learn, learn it now, now you'll be so much better off. Um, so I, and I've always loved children. I, it's funny. You mentioned, uh, uh, did you mention, no, you didn't mention teacher. That was uh, Russell on your podcast. Oh <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I, at one point I was like, ah, I wish I could be a teacher. I love kids and I love seeing how their brains work. Me too. And Talk about the aha to... moments all the time. Yes. Oh yes. It's so fun. The excitement when something clicks is just refreshing. It's wonderful. Right. Well, and they're still young and fresh and not um, jaded, <laughs> you yeah. know, because somebody hasn't tried to step down on them and make them feel like you got that wrong. You got that wrong. You, you know, it's yeah. it's so that, yeah, to have those fresh minds would be a wonderful experience to be a teacher like that. And kids do always remember their teachers. My sister's a teacher. You know, if if you're a good one, the kids remember you stick out in their yeah. mind. And he remembered all the teachers' names that it was crazy. Yeah, I love that. Um, so what what do you do now? Do you go around and talk to companies? Are you um do you stay at home still? What do you do? So uh part of my whole vision of 
retiring, my version of retiring, which is, you know, I still have my consulting business and putting the book out there. Uh, my whole vision was just to really have control over my work-life balance and really be able to own the label of stay-at-home mom. Um, so I, I stay at home, mom, I, I, I mom hard. <laughs> um, that's a hard I, job. Yes, it is. Um, and then I find ways to, you know, promote the book and work with clients, advise clients and kind of fit it into my schedule between drop-offs and pickups and baseball practice, basketball practice, volleyball practice and games and right. all of these. Things. So, um, yeah, it's, my book launched in the fall, so I kind of purposefully slowed everything else down for a bit because I just didn't know. It was my first time publishing a book. I didn't know what it was going to be like. So we had a couple of book signing events, which was really fun. And speaking to uh, the folks that came out to those was a blast. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing more speaking mm -hmm. as we go and build momentum with the book. Um, and I'm always open to uh, talking to anyone I can help on the consulting side. Um, I love dealing with anything client success. Uh, that was always my, my niche. Um, but I absolutely love, uh, anything to do with leadership and creating feedback loops and helping to improve communication between leaders and their employees. Um, it's just a, such a fun experience. You get those aha moments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. so often. Yeah, um, it's wonderful. It really is. And I have said it multiple times. So sorry, listeners, because I say this all the time, but I think it's such a big deal to write a book because it's one thing to just think, oh, that would make a good book or have the random ideas, but to take the time and have the patience to put pen to paper, get it out there, um, you know, have it published, do the chapters. I can't even imagine what it all entails, but I really kudos to you. I think it's amazing. And I agree with your son. It's, it's like you're famous. It's a big deal because that's your legacy. When you're gone, that will still be here and it will oh, still be helping you. people. So I think it's awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Funny, his, his first response was when the books were being shipped to me, my, my little stash of them, uh, he was like, can I get a signed copy? And I'm like, of course, you can all have a signed copy. I'm like, you, you just make my day. <laughs> That's so awesome. Like my mom wrote this. That's yeah. so great. So your book's obviously at Amazon. Where where else can people find you? Like, do you do um, TikTok and Instagram and all that stuff? I do. I do. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, and everything is just Mandy Shaniel. Uh, it's S C H A N I E L, which is uh, sometimes tough, but, uh, once, once you get the spelling, it's not that bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um or my website, Mandy Um, so they can go to see kind of an overview of the book, see some of my background and experience. Um, and then there's a place to see where all they can order. They can order directly from my website or see it on, Amazon, Target, all of all the different places. Um, and it's on iBooks and Kindle as well. So okay. I know I, I I always feel guilty as an author. Um, I love a hardback, but it's so much easier to read on my phone. So I'm I'm a big iBooks uh reader myself. Yeah. Um, first because I can set a goal for how many books I want to read and see it all in one place. Makes yeah. it a little bit easier. But um, so yeah, that's all available. Yeah. It's hard for us book lovers. Cause we love having that book, the tangible book, but sometimes just listening to it so you can walk while you listen to a book or listen right. to it at night while everybody's asleep, you know, it does make it a little easier, but yeah, right. I, I just love it. I love that you wrote a book. Congrats to you. Thanks. And I think that's awesome that you've got little avenues that you could take. I mean, that's so inspiring to know that there's so many other ways that you can take it. So good luck. I hope you can do more come back. If you do, I'd love to have you back. Oh, I would love to. Absolutely. I'll yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Mandy. It was great meeting you and uh, I'll be in touch. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, you having me. Of course. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.